Ladies and gentlemen, as director of the Sigmund Freud Museum, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the 49th Sigmund Freud Lecture. Uh, since the reopening of the museum in 2020, the very first time directly at the birthplace of psychoanalysis. The Sigmund Freud Lecture has been held since 1971, the year of the foundation of the museum, and always by experts from the various fields, scientific field, artistic fields, and uh, yeah. And this year's uh, Sigmund Freud lecture coincides with an exhibition that we just opened two days ago. The title of the exhibition is Surreal, Imagining New Realities. And with more than 100 artworks and by more than 50 artists, among them Picasso, Salvador Dali, um, Breton, of course, as an uh, author, and Toyen, Dorothy Tanning, Man Ray, only to name a few. We try to explore and to show the similarities as well as the differences between these two schools of thought, surrealism and psychoanalysis. And as it has always been a concern of the arts to give us insights or new perspectives on our existences, so do authors, famous writers as uh, Lisa Abignanesi, dream and write with Freud. And this is the topic Lisa Abignanesi will speak about today. Dear Lisa, on behalf of the Freud Museum, I thank you so much for accepting our invitation and that you are here with us today. And we all want to give you a very warm welcome at the birthplace of psychoanalysis. And before we have the pleasure to hear you, I um, hand over the mic to Jean Wolf Bernstein. She, yeah, she is the director of our scientific advisory board, and she will give a brief introduction into the work of Lisa Abinianese. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you. It's going to be a little bit hard to do this briefly, given all the accomplishments of Lisa Abinianese, but I try my best. So it is a great pleasure and true honor to introduce to you Dr. Uh, Lisa Apigianesi as the 49th Sigmund Freud lecturer commemorating what would have been Freud's 166th birthday. Lisa Apigianesi joins an illustrious list of speakers of a series of annual lectures which began in 1970 with Rudolf Eckstein and included presenters such as Anna Freud, Ernst Gombrich, Harold Bloom, Juliet Mitchell, and more recently, Judith Butler, Slavov Tijek, William Kentridge, Jacqueline Rose, and last year, Colette Soler. We are most grateful to Dr. Abidjanese for accepting our invitation and for thus expanding a list of prominent thinkers who have influenced and shaped the study of psychoanalysis and its related fields in profound and lasting ways. Lisa Apigianese is primarily known to psychoanalysts through her groundbreaking book, Freud's Women, which she co-authored with her late husband, John Forrester, in 1992. I think it's fair to say that this oeuvre really belongs to, by now, the canyon of psychoanalytic literature, paving the way for many authors to come to think differently, more um, Empathically, yet also critically about Freud's complex relationship to women, be it the female members of his family, his female patients, and then younger women colleagues. Apigenese examines them all. Women, she writes, may have fascinated Freud, but the desire to pursue them was sublimated into the desire to pursue knowledge. But this knowledge he acquired came through careful observation 
and listening to a woman's discourse with a new and attentive ear and a strong desire for truth. She writes, Freud would always remain most at home with fragments, pieces, his preferred methods would always be dissecting, analyzing, separating what was mixed or without a cleft, cutting through concealing veils and opening up what was hidden. I think the penchant for dissecting and analyzing and looking behind hidden veils permeates Apigenese's work as well. With her love for truth and an unmitigated commitment to pursuing the complex dynamics of passion, hidden and forbidden desires, Apigenese has written an astonishing number of books and articles, weaving between her love for psychoanalysis and her unending interest in the foibles and idiosyncrasies of human nature and desire. Among the many novels, such as her first novel, Memory and Desire, uh, The Dead of Winter, and the psychological thriller called Sanctuary, Apigenese has not shunned away from examining her own life and the loss of her husband, John Forrester, seven years ago in her memory, uh, in her memoir, Everyday Madness on Grief, Anger, Loss, and Love. This last book contains, I think, one of the most moving and honest descriptions of the sudden death of a loved one whose death was expected, but whose actual death sent shockwaves through her body and mind once she had to confront this final loss. It is, as one reviewer writes, an electrifying and brave examination of an ordinary enough death and its aftermath, one in which Lisa Apigianese uses all her evocative and analytic powers to scrutinize her own and our society's experience of grieving. Now, let me try to summarize just briefly Lisa Apigianese's many other accomplishments in life. She was born in Poland right after the war. She moved to France and then immigrated to Montreal, Quebec in 1951. She studied in Montreal at the McGill University and then moved with her first husband, Richard Apigianese, to Sussex, England, where she finished her studies and published her dissertation on Proust, Musel, and Henry James' femininity and creative imagination. A tall task, I would think. Moving back and forth between England, Canada, and New York, Lisa Apigianese wrote nine novels, among them the two I already mentioned, but also the family memoir, Losing the Dead and Memory Man. In addition, she wrote the award-winning book, Mad, Bad, and Sad, Women and the Mind Doctors in 2008, and All About Love in 2011. However, her creative mind and enthusiasm did not stop at writing critical literary books and novels, but also extended to co-writing two films on Salman Rushdie for French television and two series of radio programs on Sigmund Freud for the BBC radio station. Yeah. Apigianese has also appeared as a cultural commenter on many uh, TV programs and has been a frequent commentator and critic for The Guardian, The Observer, The Daily Telegraph, and The New York Review of Books. She was the chair of the Royal Society of Literature until 2021, and she is a visiting professor in literature and the medical humanities at King's College in London and honorary fellow of St. Bennett's Hall at the University of Oxford. She was chair of the Freud Museum in London from 2007 to 2013 and president of the English Pen. She has acted as a judge for many literary prizes, including the Men Booker International Prize in 2018. And Lisa Apigianese has been amply recognized for her literary and culturally important accomplishments. In 1987, she already was made the Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. In 2013, she was appointed officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire. And in 2015, she became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. And in 2016, she became the chair of the Royal Society of the Literary Council. 
I know that this is not a complete list of all her accomplishments, but it's pretty impressive, I think. And I think it's, it's nonetheless a fair representation of the breadth of Lisa Pijanese's impressive literary, cineastic, and journalistic achievements. And tonight, we are very happy that she decided to return to one of her old loves, namely Sigmund Freud, to lead us down a path of dreaming and writing in his memory. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Pijanese. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jeanne. I mean, one of the problems of reaching a certain age is that um, your introductions are always longer than you are. <laughs> so, but thank you for all of that. It's very kind. And um, um, I, I realize that I'm sitting in front of Freud and, and um, this wonderful description from Stefan Zweig about being a Wahrheit sadist. And um, it rather scares me <laughs> because I never know whether I'm speaking the truth, only the truth and the whole truth. But anyhow, um, I'm not a psychoanalyst and I can just pose as a writer. And so anything that comes from me can be pure imagination, but I've tried to ground it in some of the real. Um, when, when I, when I arrived here the other night I, uh, for the Surrealist exhibition opening, which was, by the way, fantastic, and you should all see it, um, I, I really had this sudden uncanny tingling along my spine um, in, in recognition of the fact that Freud had walked here and lived here and, and had always obviously dreamt here, dreamt his many books and actually put pen to paper and there are you know it is quite extraordinary how much Freud has written just looking at the correspondence you think oh my god imagine if you'd had to introduce Freud <laughs> at my age <laughs> um, uh, but one of the things I thought was that that uh, so many of the people who've come through these doors have now become iconic figures not only Freud himself but also, you know, his family, of course, Anna, um, and the many patients as well, who pressed the bell to the consulting room, as well as the analysts, the patients who were also sometimes analysts, became analysts later. Um, and they're figures who've, who've peopled the 20th century imagination, and they've certainly peopled mine, um, both in my fiction and my uh, historical writings. So coming here to address you both um, in embodied and virtual form, because I, I'm conscious that we still have uh, all kinds of, of emanations <laughs> with us, um, to mark Freud's birth and the, I think it's the 40th birth, birthday lecture, is it the have I got 49th birthday lecture, is a great, really a great honor and a pleasure. And it also to me feels something like um, a haunting, both strange and, and very familiar. So today's date actually marks the centenary of Freud's 66th birthday in 1922, um, an occasion on which he wrote to his friend, the writer Arthur Schnitzler, to say he was approaching the limit of life and may soon expect to see the end of the fifth act of this rather incomprehensible and not always amusing comedy. Freud in those difficult years after the First World War and the great flu epidemic that tragically carried away his favorite daughter, Sophie, was consumed with thoughts of death and transience and mortality. It was in these years, of course, that he moved beyond the pleasure principle of Eros to posit a death instinct with its entropic, disintegrative, aggressive and repetitive individual manifestations. I'm afraid that the turbulence of our current historical moment with pandemic and now a war in Europe means we are thrust into such dark times again. Still, Freud rallied and in 1930 seemed very pleased to have received 74 of the birthday roses he loved from his friend and benefactor, Max Eitingen, as well as a poem from his dog, Juffie, a tradition daughter Anna had initiated. <laughs> 
Um, the following year, there was a Greek vase from Marie Bonaparte. And given that he had written it was so beautiful, it was a pity one cannot take it to one's grave. This is the urn that now holds his ashes at Golders Green Crematorium in London. All this preamble really to say that marking birthdays, unlike marking the Sabbath, was not outside the Freud family tradition. And I guess tonight I'd like to make this lecture something of a birthday present to Freud by considering the various ways in which his thinking has been so very widely disseminated across 20th and 21st century cultures. Um, I stress again that I'm not an analyst, but rather a writer and a sometime historian of the field. And because of this, I, I'm probably intensely aware of the various ways in which Freud and psychoanalysis have been diffused. One way, of course, is through clinical practice, through analysts and their patients. Um, and today we see a rising number of practitioners, some of them bearing the name psychoanalyst, others who don't bear that name are nonetheless related to the field because they engage in some form of psychotherapeutic practice informed by Freud and his followers. Freud's great invention, I would contend, was certainly the technology of two, one of whom is principally a talker, the other a listener. And this is far more widespread than the so-called classical practice. So many people first become acquainted with Freud via the clinical route, or what in Britain we now designate as the mental health route, which is not a term I've always liked. Anyhow, the COVID years, at least in the UK, have increased those numbers quite remarkably. In France, I was interested to see that sometime in the autumn of uh, 2021, President Macron had announced in an echo of Freud's address to the Fifth Psychoanalytic Congress in Budapest in 1918, that all citizens were entitled to 28 weeks of free therapy to help them move out of the dark cloud of COVID. Uh, the cloud it had cast, and uh, he claimed, and Macron claimed, that 20% of French people suffered from depression. Um, maybe they're happier now that they've elected him back. I don't know. <laughs> um, I have no statistics for talking therapy figures worldwide, but if you compounded practitioners with pa patients, a proportion in who in time-tested fashion also become therapists and all of whom learn something about the language of the emotions from the experience itself, it would hardly be inconsiderable. But a second way in which psychoanalysis has been disseminated is textual through publication, translation, reviewing, and more formally through philosophy and the human sciences. This last is largely a university route. Though in France, for instance, Simone Weil was already teaching Freud to her lycée uh, philosophy students as early as 1933-34. This form is, of dissemination is inevitably interpretive and disputatious. You might say something of an ongoing argument with Freud himself. But of course, Freud was always arguing with himself as well. And he wrote in such a way that invited readers to argue with him. What is thinking, you might say? What is science, after all, if not a form of ongoing disputation and asking of questions? In the English language world, the first wave of this more academic form of Freudian diffusion began with anthropologists, for example, like W.H. Rivers, um, Malinowski in France, uh, who disputed Freud's version of the Oedipus complex and its universality, while various philosophers and sociologists, for example, of the famous um, German Frankfurt School, brought Freudian thinking centrally into their own. Students, the libidinous young, were eager um, were eager and early interwar recipients of Freudian thought. Uh, for them, Freud's name was perhaps ever tied in with sex, that permanently and perennially disruptive force. Of course, youth is also characterized by the kind of disorientation or discomfort with one's own contradictory mind and desires that Freud's thinking is immediately concerned with. It's interesting to note that in Britain until recently, relatively recently, a relatively small number, sorry, a relatively large number of eminent public figures had an association with Freudian therapy or thought, 
but that was later acknowledged when they actually made it to power uh, in later life. Um, this is one of the themes that features in John Forrester's final book, Freud in Cambridge. In their wartime transplantation to America, Adorno, Fromm, and most importantly for the generation of 1968, Herbert Marcuse, amplified the university route of psychoanalysis diffusion and propelled it into the liberation streets of the late 60s, once again underlining its subversive potential. Um, the university route had another great boost from the French Freud, of course, Jacques Lacan, uh, Lacan and um, through thinkers such as Foucault and Paul Ricoeur and uh, Jacques Derrida um, and of course France Fanon to name but a few of very many whose influence and progeny now reside in many countries across the world. For the young today, at least in the West, sex or desire is no longer an area of inhibition or repression, certainly not in the ways it was um, um, in the ways that we think of it's being pervaded in the public sphere. Rather, it's migrated into being either a super ego injunction or at least a very public capitalist injunction to partake in an array of pornographic commodities and indeed to partake of others, often self-advertised as replaceable commodities. This hard sell of sexuality is I think beginning to have a rebellious result among the young who some statistics, certainly in Britain and America, indicate engage in less actual sex than their parents. Um, and I don't think they're lying because they're always asked about others in these surveys. Um, at the same time, sex has migrated into being a sometime questionable component of gender. Given all this, the university focus for Freud and psychoanalysis has moved into literary, cultural, as well as critical theory, as well into post, as into post-colonial studies. It certainly doesn't reside in psychology departments where it is not the main language of study. Feminism and women's studies have also long formed a part of the university side of Freud, and psychoanalysis dissemination. You could easily place Simone de Beauvoir, about whom I once wrote a book, at the apex of this tradition. Of course, she knew Lacan, Foucault, and Pontalis, and many more notables early on. And through the journal Les Temps Modernes, which she, Salt, and Merleau-Ponty founded, helped spread their ideas. You'll remember that the second sex begins with an argument with Freud, indeed a rejection of what Beauvoir considers to be his determinism about the feminine. Freud, she asserts, and I think rightly so, particularly if we think of the younger Freud, grounds his ideas about women on a male model of development, adapting these to turn women as much as the other for him, as much the other for him as she is within most discourses into a mutilated man. Freud's method, the methods of psychoanalysis may be rewarding and of course, Beauvoir uses his insights elsewhere to think about love and hate, about the developing child and so on. However, since for Freud, it is the past childhood that individualizes the person and not the future, woman for him in Beauvoir's optic is tied to failure. Given her lack of castration fears from the father, and since she doesn't possess a phallus, so important in the establishing of patriarchy and so central to distorting our thinking about women's makeup, woman in this Freudian optic suffers from the failure to develop an adequate morality. Above all for Beauvoir within the Freudian universe, freedom of choice, that basic tenet of existentialism is lacking. Beauvoir rightly recognizes that there is no possibility of freedom of choice when the unconscious is given so much play and power. So for her, Freud emerges as a determinist for whom in large measure, measure anatomy is destiny. I mention all this because so many of feminism's later difficulties with a patriarchal Freud are linked to the way in which Beauvoir positions him. That said, Beauvoir may well dispute as well as refute Freud's thinking on women, but she applauds the way in which psychoanalysis represents enormous progress. After Freud, she writes, no factor comes into psychic life without having taken on human meaning. It is not the body object described by biologists that exists concretely, but the body as lived by the subject, she writes. So for example, the ovum is not experienced as part of women's situation in as significant a way 
as the clitoris. We would argue that now, given the changes in society and in reproductive technology, we could certainly argue that the egg has taken on new psychic value. And you only have to look at the, the abortion wars in America uh, to see the play of that. But Beauvoir is right in the general point indicated for her by psychoanalysis. There are few biological givens. Woman is feminine only to the extent that she feels herself as such and has lived through the experience of a female body. We could say that if Beauvoir argues with Freud and psychoanalytic thinking about women, she nonetheless situates Freud along, alongside Marx and Hegel, both of whom are crucial to her. Then too, her understanding of Freud undoubtedly turned him both into reading and writing matter for feminists. It also fed into the ways in which Freud became part of feminism, was taken up and reinterpreted by the women's movement, both antagonistically um, and more positively from the French and Italian feminists to Juliette Mitchell herself, who gave a prior lecture. I'm skipping some of this because I think you probably know quite a lot of it. Um, when the late John Forrester, who, if I remember correctly, was a member of your scientific board, when John and I set out to write Freud's Women back in the 90s, um, it was in a spirit not inimical to de Beauvoir's. In a sense, we wanted to put Freud on trial to look at and gauge his ways of seeing and thinking woman and femininity throughout his long life, one in which he wasn't afraid to reassess his own ideas. And you'll remember that, of course, Freud's life coincided with a great wave of suffragette and feminist activity and included argument from um, analysts like Karen Horney, uh, who were adamant that where there was envy, it wasn't of the penis, but of men's envy of the womb. Um, and it also included divergent ways of seeing within his own female friends and ardent followers. For example, the contention with Marie Bonaparte about whether surgical intervention, the moving of her clitoris to be exact, which was a very popular op operation at the time, um, would have a transformative effect on her sexual life. Um, Freud really wasn't sure. And it was at this time that he shrugged, I think, and said, so what is it that women want? <laughs> um, but Marie Bonaparte nonetheless stayed a beloved friend. And um, even though she fell into what Ernest Jones called Freud's, um, Freud's biographer, into his so-called masculine women. So Freud, you might say, was not afraid to argue with women uh, without feeling threatened by them or displaced by them in that ever Oedipal uh, battle of fathers and sons that he and his, the men in the circle played out so many times. In Freud's Women, we looked at Freud's conventional patriarchal attitudes, his early notions about the necessary attributes of a good and docile wife, as well as his theories about femininity. We also explored in some detail his family and patients and those early women, the hysterics, whom he called his teachers, as well as his femin uh, female followers. Um, I think um, we have in the audience Michael Ignatiev, who made a film about one of the cases that friend, uh, Freud wrote, a film called 1919, directed by Hugh Brody, which I think was partly filmed down here or certainly in a place very akin to it. And um, based on the case of the, woman, uh, the female homosexual in part, and it's a wonderful film. So you might see it at some point or show it here. So if women were an undiscovered uh, country for Freud, uh, a country, it's sometimes now said, modishly said, he wouldn't allow himself to explore fully in his own mother's lifetime, since it would have forced him into murky pre oedipal terrain. He nonetheless was prepared to recognize some of the shortcomings of his attempts and indeed his own discomfort, as he says to HD, at being cast in the mother's position in transference. He was even, I think, relatively fair, given her attitude to his daughter, Anna, to Melanie Klein and her location of Oedipal matter early in infancy, certainly in a pre-verbal phase of development. One of my favorite Freud anecdotes, a slice of Viennese um, last turn of the century life, has to do with Freud's story of the midwife. He remembers an examination of one with some medical colleagues in the 1880s. They ask her the question, why does a newborn baby sometimes defecate during childbirth? And the midwife replies, it means the child is frightened. Um, in the absence of a physiological account, the doctors dismiss the midwife's answer as ridiculous, ridiculous old wives medicine, Freud reports. 
She was laughed at and failed the examination. But silently, I took her side and began to suspect that this poor woman from the humbler classes had laid an unerring finger on an important correlation. I think I mentioned this because my daughter recently had a child, so it <laughs> came into my mind. <laughs> um, for Freud, the midwife's answer had seemed grounded in experience and sensible, perhaps old wives' midwifery was better than pseudoscientific, pseudoscientific <laughs> midwifery. Mm -hmm. Women knew a thing or two after all, and contemporary science couldn't necessarily trump that knowledge. Freud has a tendency elsewhere too, to want to burrow into what we would call old wives' tales and find the wisdom within. What else you might ask is the interpretation of dreams. Thing to a gradiva, that antique bar relief of a walking woman who forms the basis of Jensen's very popular novella and Freud's study of it. This takes a page out of popular lore, the folk wisdom of women to consider the processes of love and cure. As for femininity, femininity Freud understands it's coming into being as one trajectory of the Oedipus complex. Sexed identity for him is something of a fragile achievement rather than a natural given or essence. This is crucial to his importance for what we might call the psychological branch of feminism, since Freud problematizes any casual, easy, or direct relationship between sex, sexuality, desire, and sexual difference. And in so doing, he unsettles both biological theories of sex and sociological theories of gender. Any easy sex gender distinction as it has been formulated in certain feminist debates grows problematic within the Freudian optic. There is no simple or single-minded recourse to any stark difference between biology and culture. Freud's thinking challenges such dualisms. His ideas of bisexuality of character or behavior along a spectrum of possibilities from masculinity to femininity can't easily be shoehorned into anatomical sexual difference. Libido or drive or desire cross the physical and the mental to take shape in the psyche where both are intermixed. In this way, Freud's thinking enables new ways of understanding and imagining the meanings of sexed identity. This has become a hot debate now. It is sad on occasion these days to see this thinking produced or really rather reduced into simple um, uh, caricatures. In analyzing one of the two dreams, uh, his, oh, sorry, his own dreams, not two dreams, in the interpretation, Freud alludes to the turn of the 19th century popular novelist writer Haggard and his book She, and calls it a strange book, but full of hidden meaning, one in which woman serves as a guide to the eternal feminine, the immortality of our emotions. It's tempting to think that Freud, to an extent, let himself be led by the women, both patients and eventually fellow analysts, into a greater understanding of that immortality of the emotions, unruly and rarely governable, and indeed into the hidden continent women represented. If his question, what do women want, uh, was made part in joke to Marie Bonaparte, and part in exasperation, um, it was, I think it, it, it was certainly um, to do with his own sense that his writing about femininity was incomplete and fra fragmentary. And he advised readers to consult their own life experience or turn to the poets or wait until science might provide deeper and more coherent information. That said, we need to remember, am I running late already? <laughs> no. uh, that said, Freud was adamant about letting women into the profession um, when some of the early Wednesday group came were opposed to it. Psychoanalysis thus became one of the first equal opportunity employers, a fact abetted by Freud's insistence that you didn't need a medical degree to be an analyst at a time when in many countries, women were not allowed into medical schools. Indeed, over the 20th century and into our own, psychoanalysis has increasingly become a woman's profession. So if Ryder Haggard acts as a signpost for Freud to the country of the female, both metaphorical and real, then it's worth emphasizing how often Freud repeated that it was the writers and the poets who had preceded him in their understanding of the unconscious, of the double-sided nature of the emotions of ambiguity in word and deed. His writers included not only Shakespeare and Cervantes, Goethe, Schiller, Ibsen, and Dostoevsky, but also popular writers like those I've mentioned. Um, 
and it's important to say that Freud's interpretation of Gradiva, Jensen's popular book, um, really was a way of warning analysts that therapy, the act of therapy, the act of analysis was something of an act of love, but it was written at the time that uh, Jung was having his affair with Sabina Spielrein, and I think was sent to him as, as a kind of cautionary note that uh, that love, even if it wasn't as effective as the real thing, shouldn't go too far. <laughs> um, so if literature fed Freud's scientific imagination, if, as he said at various moments, writers, artists, and poets had got to his insights first, then it is now also extremely clear that the compliment has been returned. Freud's writings and ideas have fed the artistic, literary, cinematic imagination in any a number of ways through the 20th and into the 21st century. And it is literature, cinema, and the arts, high and low, that have served as a crucial point of dissemination for Freudian ideas. Um, initially, the danger of Freud's ideas, their subversive sexual nature, their dethroning of reason, was a draw to writers and artists, including André Breton himself. You remember his first book, Nadia, is about l'amour fou. Um, and those disorienting ideas were important to them as, uh, because they became the repositories of thoughts we don't think or don't acknowledge that we have, of forces that drive us even when repressed or wishes we don't already know, altogether know we wish. And the richness and complexity of that inner world now testified to in the laboratory or the consulting room and uncovered by a scientist, even if a disputed one, appealed to artists and mirrored their own. In a, it is a world where purity and impurity, desire and disgust coexist, where passions carry an ambivalence, where the inner life of the individual is a repository of meaning, much of it hidden from the self, but accessible through language and sometimes image. Self-censorship is always at play in that world and dreams signify. And um, it's quite clear that for Freud, the masculine and the feminine may elide and this is also extremely important to the artists who take up his cue. And all this fed into that third grand route for the dissemination of psychoanalysis, literature, the arts, and cinema. You will remember that cinema was born in the same year as psychoanalysis. I'm going rather quickly because I know I don't want to talk for too, too long um, in 1886 which saw both the publication of Studies in Hysteria and the Lumiere Brothers' projection of the first silent film. Flickering images on a screen, um, people in place so real and unreal, so much like a dream, you might say, both strange and familiar. Cinema becomes the very sphere of dreaming for the 20th century, uh, a sphere of wish fulfillment, both communal and individual, as well as a space in which deep fears are enacted. Freud was asked on various occasions to write for the cinema and he refused, but his colleague Carl Abraham did and acted as an advisor of past pubs, Secrets of the Soul, uh, that early film about psychoanalysis and the workings of the unconscious. Um, for the rest of the 20th century, films have um, it often included references to Freud and included analysts. As if you think of Alfred Hitchcock's famous thriller, Spellbound of 1945, uh, these analysts are mad, bad, and brilliant. Um, and they're also terrible murderers. <laughs> um, that's the film, um, Spellbound, of course, also includes the famous uh, scene by Salvador Dali, who I'll mention later, who's arguably the genius, certainly the most graphically talented, I think, of the surrealists. Uh, the early surrealists, about whom more and on. Um, there are many more brilliant psychoanalytically infused films to note, such as those, say, of Russian-American, or should I say Ukrainian filmmaker, Mash, uh, Maya Deren. Um, but what is overwhelmingly clear in cinema is how popular the reference back to Freud in this medium, coeval with uh, 
therapist, Gruber. <laughs> Gruber pays more attention to his patient's chips on the stock market um, than to the patient. And this means he ends up thinking that Cary Grant and Gig Young, his patient Roger, are having a homosexual affair. This is 19, early 1960s. Um, uh, this is, an, and of course, this is a no-no in psychoanalytic circles because it's only 50 years, I think, yesterday that uh, homosexuality and homosexual analysts made themselves known to the uh, American psychoanalytic. Um, the anniversary that was celebrated yesterday. <laughs> um, anyhow, this analyst Gruber thinks that Cary Grant and Dean Young are having a homosexual affair. Um, and it's quite clear that in the subtext of the film they are, but not in the main text. And this confused an analyst therefore rushes off to Vienna for a refresher course. So if you've come across Gruber, he's come off this uh, list. <laughs> um, Meanwhile, prod into action by jealousy when Doris Day goes off with another man, Carrie Grant and Gig go in pursuit of her. Why would she go away and with a man like that, Carrie Grant asks. Well, his friend says, as Freud might say, he's a man and she's a woman. Grant replies, that's the most dangerous combination in the world. <laughs> Moments later, as the taxi swerves along the motorway, Cary Grant asks, why am I chasing her? I should be grateful to the man for taking her off. And his sidekick replies, Dr. Freud would have a theory about that. To which Grant answers, if Dr. Freud had ever been exposed to this woman, he'd have burnt his cunt couch and opened a deli. And after a pause, and my apologies for the crass humor, but this is a time when everything is phallic in US popular culture, Grant gives the deli a Freudian name. Freud's famous Frankfurters. <laughs> 40 years later, the analytic story has changed somewhat, certainly in America. The analyst, often called a psychiatrist because of the kind of mingling of the two in American training, and you've all read about that. So, um, analysis becomes medical in America and then shifts. Um, the analyst called a psychiatrist acquires a more prominent space and sometimes becomes a very complex character in these films and also acts as a window into a leading character's inner life. The television series, The Sopranos, which I imagine many of you have seen, um, and which has won any number of awards and many comment, has had many commentaries about it and is apparently the most popular of all time, presents what we might call the everyday story of a waste disposable waste disposal business, complete with mafia mobsters. Its lead, Tony Soprano, in the midst of a midlife crisis, goes to see a shrink after passing out from panic attacks. Um, these have been occasioned, at least metaphorically, by his watching breeding ducks at the edge of his swimming pool. Then too, his wife is turning Catholic and there are priests everywhere and the young don't understand him at all including the young murderers. <laughs> and this story from the psychopathology of everyday American life from 1999 to 2007 um, saw viewers not only in the US, but around the world through the millennium, 9-11, the Iraq war and more. And it continues ever popular in the streaming ser services. From our vantage point here at the Freud Museum, what is perhaps the key interest is that the narrative is structured around Tony Soprano's free associations, his narrative to his analyst, Dr. Melfi, a woman, a young, attractive one to boot, shaped in the new image our contemporaneity gives to therapists. Dr. Melfi effectively tells her patient that since she has a duty to report if things like murder come up, he had better expand all violence from his narrative to her. Now, according to classic models, this call to censorship seems anathema. But in the US, ever since the famous Tarasov case, murder case in the 1960s, therapists have a duty to report violence, past or imminent, or indeed fantasized too graphically. But the therapy has some classic <coughs> elements too in The Sopranos. In the first session, Tony Soprano's resistance is high and he threatens to leave before he has begun. Dr. Melfi, didn't you admit to Dr. C you were feeling depressed? Anxiety attacks are legitimate psychiatric business. Soprano, these days, everyone's going to shrinks to get in touch with their feelings. <laughs> 
Whatever happened to Gary, Gary Cooper, to the strong silent type? He wasn't in touch with his feelings. <laughs> when he got in touch with his feelings, when everybody got in touch with their feelings, sorry, I can't find the page, I'm obviously in touch with mine. Um, when he got in touch with his feelings, it was dysfunction this and disjunction that. Do you feel depressed? Asks Dr. Melfi. I understand Freud, he answers. I understand therapy as a concept, but in my world, it doesn't go down. But in the event, it does go down. One could even say The Soprano shares a structure with Philip Roth, Philip Roth's great novel, Portnoy's Complaint, a psychoanalytic classic entailing an act of gargantuan free association, what Roth in comic mode calls, uh, using the Yiddishism, a spritz. The whole novel is narrated, you will remember, to an analyst, Dr. Spielvogel. Nabokov's Lolita, of which Roth was, of course, aware, is also a stunning parody of the psychiatric case history, one introduced by the stolidly earnest Dr. John Ray, do you remember Schreiber, <laughs> who assures us of its clinical authenticity. Ray names Humbert Humbert as a pervert, warns us that psychopathology threatens our world to the same extent that communism does. Analysis here is in Portnoy's complaint, serves as a framing device. One could say in a generalizing way that Freud and psychoanalysis frame the 20th and 21st century, propelling writers into creating character through a stream of consciousness, a parallel to free association in which the ordinary, the everyday, takes on supraordinary meaning, crisscrossing our thoughts, which are bifurcated by eruptions from the unconscious. God is a shout in the street, James Joyce tells us. Um, you'll remember he went to school with uh, Italo Svevo in Trieste and with him imbibed the dream book and much more Freudian matter. And then Joyce finishes his novel with a monologue from faithful faithless Penelope, wife to his Leopold Bloom, a modern Jewish, Jewish Ulysses who travels the streets where the psychopathology of the everyday life unfolds. Um, it's not for nothing that the autofiction of our day, very popular in the Anglo world and the Scandinavian world, you think of many famous writers, um, um, has become something of iconic in our own time uh, because it allows the reader to become the analyst. The writer puts himself on the autobiographical couch, the autofictional biographical couch. But I'm, I was going to talk to you about Portnoy in great detail and other literature, but I think I'm going to skip that because time is calling. Um, I just want to mention one thing because I, I wanted to nod at my a uh, friend in Australia, Edwin Harari, who sent me some quotes that I had to include in this lecture. He said, remember Thomas Mann, remember Thomas Mann. And I noticed it was, he was quoted in the Surrealist Exhibition um, who said of Freud's work that it's a new humanism, one that is bolder, freer, blither, more productive of riper art. But of course, by the turn of the 20th century into the 21st, Philip Roth is bemoaning the fact that we have left psychoanalysis, he thinks at that point. And of course, it's come straight back just after his death. Um, so I've gone on a little bit about this because I do think literature is important in the Freudian optics, certainly in disseminating, along with cinema, this um, Freudian idea, the many Freudian ideas. But in my closing gambit, I'd like to focus in on the visual arts. And in particular, that multi-arts and genre movement, surrealism, of which I hope you will see the exhibition um, downstairs here, because it's extremely good. Um, whatever Freud's estimate of their artistic work, it's clear that surrealist artists and writers were inspired by them. And indeed that psychoanalysis and surrealism have some structural similarities, not least in the international scope of their activity <coughs> and in their very many early women practitioners. Surrealism as a movement was launched in 1924. And of course it was the brave child of Henri Breton and some of his artist friends in the Dada movement. Um, who had come from various geographical points in the world to gather in post-war Paris, trailing with them the terrible impact of a brutal war that had turned reason, let alone truth, the truth sadist is watching me inside out, the human devastation of the war and the post-war called out for a new way of seeing. 
Bertrand had begun a medical training pre-war and had developed while working with soldiers in neurology wards an interest in neurology and psychiatry. He had started to read Freud in 1916, a reading that shook him, both altering his ways of thinking and inspiring him. And in 1921, he set out to meet the great man himself in Belgasse. The English, uh, and indeed in, in many countries, the rumors were given about this, is that Breton simply appeared on his doorstep. But as I was boldly confronted with Freud's letter to Breton in impeccable French that you can see downstairs, in fact, there was act, an actual rendezvous made and Freud had written to him to invite him to the house to see him. But that didn't quite, I think the meeting didn't quite live up to Breton's ambitious, artistic, slightly omnipotent hopes. And he later wrote of, of um, not that much later, he eventually wrote about Freud calling him an old man with no elegance and with a shabby office, worthy, worthy only of a neighborhood GP. If you've seen English GP's offices, you'd think this was regal in comparison. <laughs> but Breton's injured vanity hardly stopped surrealism <clears throat> and his own loudly proclaimed kinship with Freud, uh, with his dream book and with many of his ideas. This was clear in Breton's continuing correspondence with Freud, his experiments liberating the unconscious and centering surrealism around giving the logic of that unconscious and dream, um, chance encounters, puns, metamorphoses, the whole inner world itself, a pictorial and a literary equivalent. In the Surrealist Manifesto, Breton wrote in 1924, uh, he said, uh, we must be thankful for Freud's discoveries. The imagination is on the point of winning back its right, its rights. In 1937, Breton tried once more to have Freud appear in the Surrealist midst and asked him to contribute an essay to his anthology, Trajectoire du Rêve. Freud refused. I'm grateful to Patrick Matt, uh, Mackey, an English writer, for bringing this to my attention. He responded rather acerbically, as Breton recounted. Um, a collection of dreams without their associations, Freud said, without understanding the circumstances in which someone dreams them doesn't mean anything to me. And I have a hard time understanding what it might mean to others. Freud ever wanted his discoveries to have some focus in the therapeutic, to be grounded in the clinic. But from Breton's diary ent entry of March 17, 1938, just after he learned, mistakenly as it turned out, that Freud had been arrested in Vienna, it's clear that Breton had only deep and continuing admiration for Freud and was greatly dismayed at the thought of his fate and so much wanted to integrate him into the surrealist fold. Uh, Breton writes, bemoaning the possibility that an entire life of shining understanding of exclusive devotion to the cause of human emancipation in the widest sense may end up in one of Hitler's concentration camps. I quote him, this great master, the spirit in whom the cry of Goethe's for more light is really and truly incarnate. He from whom so many of us take our finest reasons for existence and actions he eulogizes. When he learns that Freud is not arrested, but kept under watch, he asks everyone in his milieu, and, and that's quite, a, by this time, a very wide one, to rally for Freud's release so that he can continue his life of inspiration, which we hold as dear as our own. Reading this, I had the sudden sense that Breton, for all his youthful anger at Freud, in fact, apart from imbibing Freud's ideas to feed the surrealist movement, perhaps modeled the very idea of the movement after Freud's establishment of a psychoanalytic movement. Both, of course, have a reach from their starting place and for all the metamorphoses of practice and emphasis carry on having a core which makes the work recognizable around the world from Vienna to Paris to New York to Mexico to Buenos Aires and Beijing. And surrealism, with its early number of women artists like psychoanalysis, goes on and does so globally. Despite the occasional and all revulsion of critics, the movement continues, and it's very strong at the moment. 
And I was struck by the fact that after major surrealism shows in New York and London where Freud is much referenced, the main exhibition of the Venice Biennale this year take its cue, takes its cue from the British Mexican surrealist artist, Leonora Carrington, and is named after one of her fairy tales, The Milk of Dreams. With, in an ex exhibition packed with talented women, we find Portuguese artist, uh, Paula Rego, I mention her because she's a French <laughs> psychoanalytic non pareil if ever there was one with her emphasis on uncanny childhoods. Meanwhile, there's a huge show of surrealism at the Peggy Guggenheim with a surrealist encounter with the thinking of the rituals, the metamorphic magic of non-European civilizations is also stressed. And in the context of this talk, um, it's important to remember that Freud had very fruitful encounters himself with cultures which were brought to his attention by anthropological research. I've talked to Breton's relationship with Freud who refused involvement with the surrealists per se, but Jacques Lacan, of course, had no problem with being part of the surrealist fold. He was friends with the group, indeed something of a member, and he published in its various magazines, had his thesis on paranoia reviewed by the no novelist René Crevel, who is also downstairs um, in its pages. The same review, Le, Sur Le Surrealisme au Service de la Révolution, also published early writing by Dali. And it was here that Dali developed his idea of a critical paranoia, an attempt to use paranoia for creative ends. In 1933, in Minotaur, both Dali and Lacan explained their conceptions of paranoia side by side as an active psychic phenomenon. And arguably, Lacan, if the density of the Cree and his poetic leaps or anything to go by, kept up with his, his affinity with the surrealist poets, perhaps too developed a liking <coughs> for surprise in his variable length sessions from them. <laughs> but you can tell us more about that. Freud had trouble understanding how dreams without associations and analytic process to decode them had any sense. But for the writers and artists and photographers, the waking dreamers who made up the surrealist movement that traveled continents and time into our own, the terrain of dreams, the unconscious and its logic, desire and repression, and the destiny stick and so on that Freud had opened up remained both inspiring to their work and meaningful. On July 19th, 1938, little more than a month after fleeing Nazi Vienna and arriving in London, a frail Freud, rather deafened by an ear infection, received a visit from surrealism's most notorious artist, Salvador Dali. A longtime student and admirer of his writings, Dali came through the intercession of Freud's friend, Stefan Zweig, also in London, and who accompanied him together with Dali's wife, Gradiva, as he called his wife. Gaia and his patron, Edward James. Dali sometimes alleviated Freud's suspicions about, uh, sorry, Dali somewhat alleviated Freud's suspicions about the surrealists with whom Dali had in any case by then broken. Freud, as far as we know, had not seen Dali's work or his film, Un Chien de Lou, with its wonderful cutting of the eyes. The eye is so important to surrealism, whereas of course Freud is very keen on the ear. Um, it is famously based on the two men's recounting of their dreams to each other. Um, Dali wanted Freud, whom he had been reading since he, the war years, to take him seriously as a researcher into dreams and the unconscious, as well as as an artist. And he brought with him an article he had written on the unconscious and critical paranoia and his rather wonderful painting owned by Edward James, The Metamorphosis of Narcissus of 1937. The subject of Narcissus was hardly unknown to Freud, and in the Dali painting, you'll remember a beautiful, graceful Narcissus gazes raptly into a pond of his own, at his own image, while his repeated double in the foreground emerges as a hand clutching a cracked egg out of which a Narcissus grows. All of this against an antique landscape in which a naked in which naked women dance. It's clear that Freud didn't quite know what to make of this Spaniard. It's also clear that Dali may have been a little paranoid or rather as paranoid as usual in the presence of his idol and over-interpreted Freud's response as negative. Dali describes Freud as staring at him with a fixity in which his whole being seemed to converge and saying to Zweig, I have never been a more, seen a more complete example of a Spaniard. What a fanatic. Before his imperturbable indifference, my voice became involuntarily sharper and more insistent, Dali writes. 
Freud examined his painting and apparently said to him, in classic painting, I look for the unconscious, sometimes translated here as the subconscious, in surrealist painting for the conscious. This strikes me as a rather cunning intervention of the kind a seasoned analyst would make to a patient. Dali necessarily resisted and imputed unresponsiveness to Freud. But Freud was far more impressed with Dali than the latter thought. It seems he was hardly indifferent to genuine talent. He wrote to Zweig, I really have reason to thank you for the introduction which brought me yesterday's visitors, he says to Zweig. For until then, I was inclined to look upon the surrealists who apparently chosen me as their patron sake as absolute, let us say 95%, like alcohol, cranks. But that young Spaniard, however, with his candid and fanatical eyes and his undeniable technical mastery has made me reconsider my opinion. Dali kept sketching Freud during their meeting. Eventually, he produced the portrait that we now see in the Freud Museum in London. Um, the version you have here in the Surrealist exhibition is, is rather different. It doesn't show Freud's carapace as a snail, which uh, Dali wanted to pick out. He said he had uncovered the secret, the morphological secret of Freud's cranium as a snail. <laughs> um, the, the image below has, has actually a woman and something rather more sexual in that area of the brain. But um, anyhow, extracting Freud's brain may have been one of Dali's uh, meta metaphorical aims, but Spike didn't send the drawing to Freud. What Dali had captured, he thought, was a skull, the ailing Freud was coming to his end. What this meeting leaves me with is the notion that Freud in his very old age had begun to see some value in the surrealists, so long the diffusers of his own work, if in the many guises they made so emphatically their own. It's also tempting to think that the younger, more subversive Freud, not yet quite so intent on consolidating the clinical side of his own movement would have been more open to their artistic researches, which so often seek to give expression in pictorial form to the workings of the mind he had so powerfully investigated. Um, I, I did say a few more things, but I think that's enough. And I would leave the rest of the time for your questions and indeed for any questions that come to us online, um, of which I hope there will be some. Thank you. I do realize that in cutting this short, I've cut short on something that I had said in the abstract I would talk about, which is Freud right now and the uses of Freud right now. But you, you think I should do that? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I sometimes wonder what Freud might say or indeed feel were he to reappear in our times and see the ways his ideas have spread, see the way too that individuality has become so penetrated with diagnostic categories, compounding a Freudian self with a psychiatric self. What would he have made of the way individuality has been so confused with a case as to become coterminous with it? the way in which individuality is so often now self-defined as a pre-diagnosed psychological disorder? What would he have made of the confessional clamor of the social or perhaps antisocial media, or indeed of the reiteration of childhood trauma, constantly reignited and repolished, or indeed of any trauma as a definition of identity, a rather permanent definition of identity? I'd like to imagine, and of course, this is pure projection from about someone who talked about life's comedy, that he might have wanted to amplify his thinking about ordinary unhappiness, the kind that needs an admixture of stoicism, perhaps too to disaggregate sex from any easy equation with satisfaction. So that rather than thinking in terms of happiness, as we now do, of emphasizing our traumas, and this is particularly the case in America and in the Anglo world, as singularly constitutive and, and um, of us. And so never living up to the mark we may feel entitled to, and um, or that we've been that we've been sold as the most desirable mark. And that we so that we begin to consider what constitutes a good enough life 
despite inevitable lacks. After all, that task of analysis of psychoanalytic practice was ever for, for Freud, an attempt to allow people to live an open life, one open to change and challenge. Then too, my returning fantasy Freud may have wanted to reflect on the virtual sphere, the way social media, despite its reputed socialness, forgets the living body, a factor that may not be separate from the way it unleashes rage at every turn. Caught within the confines of our own mental emotions, a causing childlike omnipotence and envy leap into action at every unregulated click and murderous fury pours out at two dimensional enemies. But it's rather presumptuous to speak for 21st century Freud. What I do know that writing and dreaming with the Freud we have, um, ever changing and as he necessarily is and open to interpretation, and reinterpretation continues to kindle 21st century thoughts. So happy birthday, Sigmund Freud. <laughs> So very happy to take any questions if you have any. If not, we could all just go and have a drink. <laughs> I think we have to wait a little bit first for questions here. Of course. And then I'm looking at the chat function or not chat function. So far there are no questions. And feel free if my English was a little rapid to ask anything else. And if I can't answer, I'm sure Jeanne will be able to Please. Uh, thank you for that great talk. Uh, you mentioned that in Freud's writing, he took a lot of inspiration from the arts, especially literature, visual arts, sculpture. You mentioned that within the university route, he's especially popular within the literary departments, cinema departments, and visual art departments. However, I've always been curious about how Freud does not really write about music very much. And at least in the United States academic community, there seems to be a lot less affinity with Freud in music departments as opposed to literature departments or cinema departments. And that leads to my question. Uh, in your opinion, is there anything about Freud's work that makes him less applicable or relevant to music as an art form as opposed to other art forms? Thank you for that. And this has long been the cliche about Freud that he um, didn't respond to music. Um, I'm not sure that is correct, because there are references to opera in his work. And of course, he did go and hear music. Um, and he had musical friends. Um, um, he was a great admirer of um, Yvette Gilbert, who was a singer, a very popular singer of her time of the turn of the century. And he was somebody who focused on the ear. I'm, I'm very interested, in part, in Freud's um, listening therapy. Um, and obviously, he found something in the human voice, um, as much as in, you know, the use of the, of the eye, which was, of course, the clinical method at the time, the psychiatric method that, you know, he's sometimes distinguished from and should be distinguished from at, during his own lifetime, was the clinical gaze, the method of the clinical gaze. When he trained with Shaku, it was all about the clinical gaze. It was about capturing through the eye. Um, and when Freud turned to practice, first of all, he sat behind the patient. He didn't like to be seen, but he also didn't particularly like to see. And he did like to listen. So, you know, I don't know how I would theorize the musical Freud, but I, I do think there is something for composers within him. Um, and particularly for the contemporary, because of his interest in disruption and, um, um, and pauses and... Um, you know, following the voice without following it consciously, following it unconsciously, which is, of course, what music also does. I don't know. I'm, other people here may be more qualified to answer this than I can, but I do think it's an interesting area. I once had to do on a talk on Freud and music at the South Bank, um, and I was very curious to do this to a musical audience. Um, and they were, they were very taken with this, that, you know, why wouldn't one of the um, 
leading thinkers, if you like, of, of the 20th century and into our own, be completely blind to a field. I think what Freud attempted to do in his own lifetime was he tried, because he, want, he did want to be thought of within the scientific community. Um, so he, all his greatest loves, you know, perhaps against himself, he distinguished himself from. Um, you know, he, he didn't want to be a surrealist. He didn't want to be a writer or a poet. Um, he didn't want, and yet he wrote as if he were a writer. And his case histories are written. They're not medical case histories, which, as you know, are very bracketed and short and, and deal in quite different ways and do deal with categories rather than fluidity. Um, so there are lots of things he didn't want to be considered in, you know, the spheres of the arts. Um, but in fact, I think he was quite open to them and, and um, you know, very permeable to them. He was good at resistance. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'd love to uh, continue your spec oh, I'd love to continue your speculative mode. I'm very taken with what you just said about uh, Freud's fascination with an enactment of resistance. Um, I, I love what you just said about the way he was simultaneously attracted to particular authors or or movements. And uh, but nonetheless resisted it, but then somehow found himself enacting it. And Schnitzler being a perfect example, he avoided meeting uh, until the very end because he was afraid he'd find a, a double in yeah. Schnitzler. Um, I'm wondering in that in that vein, um, whom today or since his death, which which uh, aesthetic figures do you think he would have a similar relationship with? Oh, that's a very broad question. You can, you can answer this as well as I can. I mean, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me. It's very hard to put yourself into the position of a Victorian gentleman. I mean, you, I think the young Freud was very different to the older Freud, the Freud who was heading a movement um, is a very different human um, in many respects to, to the young man who wanted to conquer blah blah and, and you know do all these extraordinary things and did hang out um, <laughs> with other people so you know if you'd ask me would he like Philip Roth for example who obviously adored Freud um, would he respond to his humor well it depends what epoch of Freud's life you were thinking about I mean what would he think of Portnoy's complaint he might laugh but then he might say publicly in a Congress, this is not what we mean, <laughs> you know, he could do both. Um, it's possible because, you know, if you hang out with writers and artists, which I have done throughout my life <laughs> too much, you're not a serious person. You're always laughing. But then Freud loved jokes. And he did say the jokes were, first of all, a key to our lives, but also one of the most important parts of our lives and a key to discovering who we were. Um, but also key really to making us social animals, making us able. He always relates in jokes, you know, the joker to the recipient of the joke. Um, they're not jokes that we would laugh at anymore because they're not of our time. But, you know, so if Freud were re-embodied, um, not, a, not as necessarily an American practicing analyst, but as, you know, as a writer, about the areas of mind. Would he like Philip Roth? Would he like Klaus Gard? He probably would. He would probably learn from them and, and see things and, and then resist and say, no, no, that's not the same as analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what analysts do. <laughs> you can't come in saying, you know, actually, I'm just like Philip Roth. I'm just like Portroy or I'm just like uh, Klaus Gard. You know, I spent a lot of time worrying about my father's death and da, da, da. You can't, you can't quite do that. It's not how it works. But, um, you know, if you were standing here and talking and, and Wahrheit was being sadistic, he might confess that he actually had a giggle about these things. <laughs> Does that say anything? Yes. <laughs> Nothing. No, 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 no. <laughs>
There's one question from afar. Maybe you just have the microphone. Ah, okay, thanks. If it's so, not that you shouldn't read it. Well, I am not that quick. Uh, I will see, you have to bear with me. Um, I would like to hear your perspective on when and by whom anti-Freudism, movement against Freud and psychoanalysis, as well as demonization of Freud began, what particularly caused it in popular culture, and why is it still pretty much part of the discussion when it comes to psychoanalysis? Thanks in advance. Um, let me just read it so to make yes. sure I've got it. Um, so when the... Okay, well, you know, this is another lecture. Um, um, maybe two, maybe three. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, there... You know, I think Freud and anti-Freud are contemporary. Um, there is no Freudianism without anti-Freudianism. Uh, Freud certainly constantly enacts uh, his own um, thinking as if there were an opponent out there who is uh, naysaying, um, who's disputing with him, who's arguing with him. And I think there is in his own mind as well as in reality. And um, he presents his, his thinking in ways which are not traditional, you know, after the book on aphasia, which is still very much in the scientific mode, he presents his thinking in ways which don't pass um, the necessary um, hurdles of what it means to write scientifically. In that sense, you could say Darwin wasn't a scientist as well. And in Britain, it's clear that Darwin only became an important scientist in uh, this is not altogether right, but in the 20th century um, and continues to be very important in our day, um, but was not, uh, he wrote too well. That's not scientific writing. <laughs> um, Newton did not write well. Um, Newton's a proper scientist. Anyhow, so, so um, um, anti-Freud thinking parallels Freudian thinking. Into the 20th century and in our own time, I think particularly in America, and the story is different in different cultural, I don't know why I'm talking to the screen, um, as if there was somebody there. <laughs> um, um, in, the, in the 20th century and into our own time, um, the story is different depending on where you are. I couldn't tell you the Viennese story because I don't know it. Um, I can tell you the American story um, and the British story. And um, I mean, just to go with the American one, it's, it's always a kind of uh, trendsetter. Ooh, I'm sitting on a pillow. <laughs> um, the American story is very, very simple. Freudianism is, is really, really strong until um, that moment in the 60s when there is a trial against a, a, a psychoanalytically inclined hospital and doctor for um, not giving a depressed patient the existing um, psychoactive drugs, not psychoactive, but, you know, <coughs> antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, and towards the end of the 60s, while there is Freudianism in the streets, the movement in the medical profession moves against analysis and into the biological sphere. And that argument between, um, if you like, psychoanalysis and you know, what could be called neurologies, the, the many uh, configurations of neurology through the 20th century and into our own, carries on through um, the two centuries. Um, and by the time you get to the 80s, the biological model is intact and the chemical model is intact and everybody is it begins to be against analysis, except perhaps in New York, um, you know, where they're still into play. Now, the psychoanalysts are themselves partly, the American psychoanalysts, are partly responsible for this because I think the profession was, was doing strange things. It was against too much. It was too, pres too prescriptive. It wasn't a very open um, uh, profession to people's problems. But um, the anti-Freudian um, ethos takes shape. And that is then compounded by the kind of university branch of anti-Freudianism, which grows up hand in hand, and this history has yet to be written. Um, 
I certainly haven't written it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it grows hand in hand with Freudian, Freud's migration into the human sciences. Um, so there is an anti-Freudian movement and um, meanwhile, the theoretical Freudianism of a kind takes hold through Derrida and Foucault, a, a Foucault in a cloaked way because Foucault is against cases and doesn't like psychiatric designations. And I think deliberately mi mixes psychoanalysis up with psychiatry. Uh, but I mean, that's something else. So, so um, while the medical model is high, the biological model is high, um, and the Prozac era in which drugs seem to work carries on undoubted. Um, Freud and psychotherapy are in the doldrums. But then there's a kind of, um, I don't know, we're, we're at this kind of moment. Depending on where you are, people still talk about drugs do work. And some drugs do work for some people at some point in time. In my book, the, the drug model is very much a continuation of the street drug model. And um, its definition, it's something I've written about in Mad, Bad and Sad. I mean, its definition of what the human being is, the individual is, is, is a drug model. You have happiness up here and you have depression down there. And uh, you're, you're sort of conditioned to be one or the other. You can't sort of be wavering the whole time or you can't just move along in a, in a kind of... Yeah. The state we normally move along in, which is we don't we don't register this. We're too busy doing, <laughs> um, and um, I th I think at, we're still at that moment. It's quite clear that many of the antidepressants don't work immediately. They take a long time to work. They can cause har harmful effects. They cause all kinds of side side effects. You know, people get larger, but the street drugs do the same, and. Um, you know, if you look at America and its street drug problem, it, it kind of mirrors the, um, the drug problem within medical practice. And in, in, the, in the crevice be between these two, therapy has come back. Um, you know, people realize that it's not working just with drugs. You need drugs and therapy. In Britain at the moment, um, th there aren't enough therapists around. So people, the GPs will give you drugs or they'll send you to a psychiatrist, you're given a drug, things go terribly wrong, you're sent to a therapist for 20 sessions, nothing much happens, you go back on drugs and people are in this, in this terrible loop. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of pro-Freudian, anti-Freudian, that has been going on since the very beginning of that history, of our history with it. So we have one more question actually from Ruben Garo, who is a oh hello Ruben, uh, who is a member of our uh, scientific board. Question for Lisa: I was very interested in your mention of current debates about identity that insist insist on the constructed and deconstructible nature of gender. Would you say that this view is irreconcilable with Freud's theory of the psyche as governed by universal structures? Could this explain which contemporary gender theorists like Beatrice Preciado appear antagonistic to the Freudian project? I can't, Ruben. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just too tired. <laughs> could, you, could you answer this for us? Come, come, show your face and answer it for us. I mean, I, um, <sighs> I can't do this. I, it would take me too long. And also, I'll end up with the wrong tweeters. I'm sorry. It's, 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 a, very, it's a very complicated question. And um, I think, again, is worthy of a, of a lecture of its own. And I think somebody who's wiser than me has to give it. It's another conference. So is there one more question from the audience? Yeah, here in the back. So last question. Could you stand up so I can hear you better? Uh, we need the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. So hopefully maybe a quick question, but you mentioned you didn't like the term mental health so much, right? <laughs> 
Um, I, I, did I get that correct? Mm -hmm. So if I did, maybe would you like to explain that? Because I just find it interesting. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 mental health. Yes. You said in your lecture you didn't like the term mental health. And uh, well, the question is why? I just don't like the way it sounds. <laughs> I think, it, you know, health is a very strange concept for me. It's a very loaded concept. Um, and almost mental health is a contradiction in terms. It, it reminds me of kind of sanitation movements and it's epidemiological. Um, it's maybe, maybe it's useful epidemiologically and for the UN, but I don't, I don't think it's actually, you know, if you said to me, are you in, you know, how is your mental health today? I, you know, I would be completely stuck. <laughs> No, what you say? Would I say, you know, oh God, I, you know, I'm feeling too hot, and I, you know, I feel overexcited, or, you know, I'm, I, it, it's not. Um, I'm, I'm very sad that the word came in, but you know, it, it's there, and we can't do anything about it for a while until it changes. I do think it comes from the wrong place, um, and it's, it's very, very hard to measure in any way. And I think it was introduced in order to qualify as a measurement. But in fact, um, you know, it's not an area that has the right kinds of measurements attached to it. What, what, do, the, what do you say in German for mental health? Is it a term that's used? No. Of course. Who is always talking about this association of psychiatry? This one of the organization, and they are always. Hello. Yes. They're always talking about mental health, I think. I think that you, there's a confusion in the, in the English language as to what the mental includes. And I think, you know, maybe it's, maybe it comes from the French, I shouldn't say that. I'll be, I won't, they will let me back into the country. I mean, maybe it's a Cartesian problem, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know, uh, it's a cogito problem, isn't it? And about the mental, yeah. this word. And but, you see, we've I, now, we've now, we now have a whole new area of study, which is the emotions, um, as if the mental and the emotional had nothing to do with each other. So, the, so the biggest problem of the school medicine is really the rational way of thinking mm -hmm. and without including emotions, because medical terms narrow should be allowed to determine over the life of the human beings. Yes, I don't like the word mental, but I like the word health even less in this context. <laughs> but I'm afraid we need to end because it's 8.30. And uh, we really want to thank you for this sumptuous psychoanalytic meal. And I think that uh, the true sadist would be very happy about the gift you offered him. And talking about gifts, uh, I want to um, invite you at the end of this lecture, which has not so much so closely to do with uh, um, Freud and theory and dreams and literature, but as we want to encourage you, those who are here, to donate to a fund for the Ukraine um, that uh, we have uh, full trust and will go to the right people in the Ukraine. So those who are here, we will send you the information on your emails with which you registered. And uh, we would really like to um, encourage you to donate. We have um, uh, Mr. Phil's here. We have his father here. They are the ones who are uh, distributing the money once you've donated uh, uh, to the Ukraine. And we have another account uh, as well, both of which will go directly to needs of therapy in primarily in Lemberg, in Biff, um, or medical uh, costs there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>